Can everyone hear me? Hi there. All right, we're about to begin. My name is Johnny Lu, and I'm one of the founders of Brooklyn Research. We're here doing an auxiliary event for our Creative Tech Week. Uh, for Creative Tech Week this year, we're doing a talk called The Project Itself, or a series of talks. I would love to present. A s uh, before that, I would like to talk about Brooklyn Research first. Uh, we are a basically a co working space and a kind of a research center, and we hold a series of events and workshops throughout the year. And one of the things we're also trying to launch this summer is research groups that basically dive into the intersection of technology with art, design, and community spaces. Um, if you can, please check out our website, brooklynresearch.org, and subscribe to our newsletter, or like us and follow us on Facebook. Anyhow, without further ado, I'm going to present Matthew Ortega. Matthew Ortega is an artist, designer, and musician working at the intersection of art and technology. He attended Mason Grove School of the Arts in the 2000s, where remix culture and questions of authorship reemerged as a result of new technologies. After having worked with collage and archival videos for many years, he now applies his skills as a digital designer and programmer to start creating custom software to further expand his artistic expression. Though he still works with ideas of refuse, decay, and distortion that come from remix culture, he also began to explore what technology can be offered to one's own art practice. So here is Matthew Ortega. Thanks, guys. Uh, and hello. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to spend the, the next um, 20 minutes talking about a project called In Orbit, which is um, part of uh, Creative Tech Week. It's going to be installed at the conference hub. But I'm also, also going to talk about uh, just my work in general and a couple of other projects. Um, but first, I'm going to go back to um, how I initially got into working with the medium I'm working with today, which is creative computation. Uh, specifically, I, I use processing often for uh, making my work. Um, but this is one of the first sketches um, that I did a few years ago. I had been primarily working with uh, collage and traditional media. Um, and I went to school for, for painting and video, for example. Um, but a few years ago, I got my hands on working in code after um, I took a couple workshops and uh, seeing the work of Casey Rios and Joshua Davis, um, I started to use processing to explore new ideas. And but I'd say before uh, going too much into uh, past work, before I started working with computation, I'm just going to show a quick uh, slideshow of um, my studio diary um, and the work that I post online. So since I was pretty new when I started working out with computation and coding, um, I tried to approach the medium with an open mind because I knew that I had a lot to learn. Um, I feel like initially it was good for me to just find out what I can do um, with this new medium. Um, and I'm always doing explorations and posting them on Instagram, for example, to kind of show like the process and thinking that goes into a new project. Um, so in here, I'm exploring things um, such as brush making, design, movement, physics systems, repetition, randomness, uh, geometry, formations that you can find in nature, and different printing techniques. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of variation in this exploration. I don't really want to limit myself at this stage, and I hope that I always keep this sort of um, exploratory and sketch-like exploration using code. Uh, and I find that the, the, the medium itself is actually very inviting to work in this way, the, uh, some of the new frameworks such as processing, or not new, but the frameworks that people use for creative coding are very inviting to work in a sketch-like manner. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today is actually a specific project called In Orbit. Um, and 
And I was able to work on this project while attending um, ITP camp, which is a summer camp for adults. Kind of uh, takes place in the month of June. And it gives people access to work with um, technology that they might not have and also think of how to use it in, uh, for creative purposes. So while I was there, I was exploring a lot of different things, but I wanted to try to make a project that um, worked with Microsoft Connect, which is a 3D sensor and it basically like a think of a camera for 3D space. But then at the same time, looking at the work from my studio diary and the, the work that I'm normally doing, um, I, I consistently return to this idea of designing my own brushes, I call them, um, which are basically, it's kind of particles in, in technical terms. But um, imagine a, a brush that you would use in Photoshop, but with some extra parameters and it could be, uh, different behaviors. So, the reason I think this is important is because um, it's basically, in its most basic form, it's tool design. And it got me thinking a lot about tools in general and the tools that we use, such as Photoshop or um, the apps on your phone. And with each tool that you embrace, you're, you're um, basically accepting and conforming to the, the thinking of the, the person that designed that tool. Um, you're expected to fit into the, their, their thinking style as opposed to you, uh, as opposed to the tool adjusting to the thinking style of you. Um, so that's why I think programming was very exciting and important as, as a practice because when I'm able to design my own tool at the most basic level of a brush, um, it really opens up the future in a big way and, and, and has a different starting point than what I'm usually um, expecting when you use something like Photoshop. So. Even starting from this microcosmic point, um, again, it sort of leads to an unknown future. And um, that was basically the starting point of uh, in orbit. I'm just going to, just to give you a better idea, I'm just going to play a quick video of the documentation of this installation. So uh, just speaking technically, this piece w works in a way that there's uh, different zones of interaction. So um, using the connect, I, I define three different zones that people can walk into and trigger uh, different brushes within those zones. Um, the interaction isn't really one-to-one -one in the sense that like the way you would draw with a pencil or use a digital software to draw and you'd have uh, immediate feedback. but um, so the viewer's presence and interaction does uh, change the work though, so there is some response. And what I found really nice when I was showing this, um, when it was installed, is that there was a nice moment of like learning and surprise that the, the viewer had to go through. Um, at, at first they're trying to move around and see how the work is being affected and then they get this moment where they realize what, what, what is happening in the work. 
Um, and the different brushes that are being triggered are, are some of them use the exact form of their bodies. Um, others are sort of like exploding shapes and forms. Others um, integrate uh, digital refuse, or what I call a like digital torn paper. Um, and they all leave semi-permanent marks. Um, each brush also has a specific duration or lifespan. And I think overall this ends up creating a very or organic uh, piece in a way. And one that requires the, not only the viewer's presence, but um, uh, just the, 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 the traces and marks over time and seems to represent time in that way too. It's, uh, So I think if there's a couple things that I thought about after making this piece was um, a couple of aspects that are, might be unique to uh, digital media art in general and I'm, how I'm trying to work with those moving forward. Um, and one of them is that, that the idea of building a responsive system. Um, being able to take ideas from traditional media and then add interactivity to that and also movement and responsiveness is, is pretty unique to digital media, which, which I feel like we should take advantage of. Um, yeah, because I would say that the, the way that people, um, that come, the way that di uh, digital media is commonly used is to actually mimic tr traditional media. And you see that in a lot of the software that people use like Photoshop, for example, and uh, even, I, I think in one in particular that was a project by Microsoft that was a, per, uh, a complete infrastructure to recreate new Rembrandts, for example, which is, you wonder if, I mean, it's a cool idea, but at the same time, it's like whether it's a good application or whether it represents the, um, what I like to call it, the digital gesture in a way. Uh, what's possible within the digital gesture? Um, a second aspect that I, which I really, um, took note of was this relationship between the uh, myself, the viewer, and the system that I built. So um, what I noticed was, was that it was kind of hard for any other entity to uh, take responsibility for the work or to take ownership of the work. It was really a sort of shared symbiotic relationship. Um, I think that the projects that I'm continue to work on, I'm trying to emphasize this point of uh, having a relationship with the computer in a way and having a, trying to connect that with people, trying to connect that with nature and stop trying to view the machine as a sort of inorganic object. Um, and I think this relationship also has the ability to reveal the p potential of the system that I wasn't expecting. So after the, t the tool has been designed, uh, you don't really know what the tool can produce yet. So seeing it installed for the first time, um, there was a lot of magical moments that I just didn't think would happen or it does things that are very unexpected. But overall, I think what's important about this relationship as well is that it challenged my notions of like artistic authorship. Um, I never really took ownership I mean, a part of my ego, I would say, does take ownership of the work I do, but I've always liked to ditch the Renaissance idea of like artistic genius. And I think working in this way has um, sort of gotten rid of that for me and acted as, as, as a liberation almost. So these are, these are a couple of the ideas that I'd like to um, keep working with as I move ahead. Um, and I'd say the last aspect is one that I, I actually think about a lot. Um, it's kind of hard to avoid when you're working with computation, and it's an aspect of, of speed. Um, so there's a drastic difference in speed when working with traditional media um, versus working with computation. Even, as, even as something as simple as a uh, pointillistic style of drawing, um, once you're able to go from an idea um, uh, and pass the technical aspects of computation, and quickly express an idea that you might have in your head. And, and if it is something like a drawing, for example, that you know that can be done much faster by writing a program, it's kind of hard to not do the program because you know you can just do it faster. Um, so it's a, bit, it's a bit of a jab towards 
um, processes that you might have enjoyed in the past, but that are now challenged by the computer. And, and I feel like this isn't really like a, a new thing either. I mean, we see in the news all the time thing, things like um, the best Go player in the world being uh, beat by an artificial intelligence. So, but at the same time, I think there's still things to gain um, from this, from working with, with traditional media. And it's this idea of um, s experiencing the differences in speed uh, purposefully. And to explain this, I'm just going to show an image of uh, somebody moving fast in a car. And when you're moving fast, the actual forms um, and shapes change. So it's a totally different perspective. And you might see things that would be impossible if you were moving very slow or even at human speed. Um, human speed would be something like us in this room. Uh, that's a perspective we're all familiar, familiar with. And then a slow speed would be something like this glacier, things that are found in nature, which are, if you sped them up, th this would actually look like a river of moving ice. But because it's moving at a speed that, um, that you find in nature, um, it, it has the appearance that it's not moving at all. So I think I'm trying to work between these speeds and, and bring um, aspects of that speed into computation, but then bring aspects of computation into drawing and also my own experience as a, as a person. But overall, I'd say this is a good example of things, something that is very easily done in, uh, with code, but then to do the same thing might take very a very long time. So, um, and this is actually a piece that I do. It's a more performative aspect um, of live drawing and, and working with sound. So those are, that kind of wraps up the the line of thinking that emerged from the project in orbit, and I'm, I, I keep working with these ideas in the the work that I'm doing now. Um, so what have I been up to since then? Um, I just have a couple other projects I'm going to show, the short videos. Um, and one of them is called uh, BitRot. So th this was an uh, installation that I, I did while um, at the School for Poetic Computation in the fall. Um, it's basically a webcam, a monitor, and software built with processing and OpenCV. And, um, the program looks at the room and is scanning for faces, and when it finds a face detected, it'll take a snapshot. Um, it only holds two image buffers, the one that's taken and the one that was previously taken. And over time, the one in the front um, decays organically using a, 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 a game of life, what's called a game of life algorithm. And eventually, they're both merged into one. Um, but basically, it was, a com it was a commentary on the use of face tracking. And if there's an ethical way to use, uh, or um, ethical way to use data and, and a way to incorporate elements from nature, such as decay, into uh, the way we use information. So what if, you're, um, what if data was more like how it is in our minds, where things seem to get fuzzy and disintegrate over time? Uh, here's a quick video of the installation.
so the last thing I'm going to show is the, the most recent project I worked on. Um, oops. And yeah, so I had the chance. Uh, I, I had the chance to spend some time in Madrid um, the, the past few months, and uh, I met an artist there named Gregorio Scopa, a musician. And we immediately decided to um, collaborate together, and it was, it was kind of a new opportunity for me to to get to start working with sound uh, in the visual aspect. I mean, I, I'm a musician, so I work with sound normally, but I've been looking to find a bridge between the two for um, quite some time. So this was a great opportunity to do that. And we also had a few other uh, friends that were um, looking to do set design and also the production of their performance. And um, I'm just going to show a sample of uh, the, it ended up being about a 45 minute performance. So I'm just going to show a short sample of the result. Yeah, so that's a sample. Um, I'm about to post uh, another longer version of, uh, um, it's also a sample of the performance, but a longer version of this on my site if anyone's interested. Um, yeah, so thanks. And uh, if you want to find out more about my work, you can go to, you can follow me on these places or, and I'll be around after if anyone has any questions. Thanks. So we're going to open up for, I guess, 10 minutes of questioning if anyone is has any questions regarding Matthew's work. I'm going to hand you the microphone. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It was uh, genius. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the last piece. I mm -hmm. what, was, what was the connective tissue uh, between sound and... Um, so those are, those are actually good examples of an individual brush that I designed. So in that case, it was these sort of uh, wiry formations, and I was using uh, um, what they call like a random walker. So this thing takes steps in random directions. And then it's influenced by the sound that he would be uh, doing during the performance. So, um, but in, in pieces like this, too, I also were performing together, so I'm also controlling certain parameters of the, the elements as well. So how long they might jump, or the color that they might have, and things like that. So. Um, I really appreciated Bitforms. I guess this is more of a comment, or okay. yeah. <laughs> um, but I appreciated Bitforms a lot because it reminds me of oral migraines. If you've ever had a migraine, except it's a lot prettier. Hmm. Um, and I was wondering if it was mostly inspired by memories, or if you've ever experienced something that like made you think about how to represent that. Um, yeah, I think at the time I was thinking a lot about the way. Um, yeah, the way that basically memories are stored in our own minds and how, um, well, I guess I came across information, I guess bit rot's actually a real thing that occurs um, to data on like stored hard drives. So over time, the data is not permanent. There's people are always trying to find ways to make their data permanent. And my, my thought is always like, why do you want to make it permanent? It's like great that we can like forget and renew ourselves. And that's the sort of pattern that you see in nature everywhere too. So. Um, I wanted to try and, you know, and also response to like face tracking software and privacy to start to build data structures that will give us another chance to renew our image or ourselves in the future, you know. Um, but at the same time, I was, I'm always trying to find a way to connect it back to 
collage, you know, which is I want to make also an image of distortion and. I just wanted to also uh, say that uh, Matthew is going to present his uh, piece in Orbit on Thursday on Creative Tech Week. Uh, so you can join the conference on Thursday, or uh, not Thursday, Friday, uh, next week, or for free on Saturday. It's going to be also open in N NYIT. So yeah, come check it out. <laughs> yeah, and my question actually, um, it was just kind of thinking, why did you decide to name the piece uh, in Orbit? I think I've always had fun with naming pieces. Uh, sometimes it comes from music I'm listening to or even just random thoughts I have. But in this case, um, and I would say that probably that doing stuff like that probably comes to uh, being part of this music scene that I was in in college that was very, um, very like data like and people were very into remixing and collage and uh, in, in that way. But there's also an aspect of re revolution with the particular brush. So um, using the connect, it's very easy to rotate in a 3D pattern the, the movement of the brush. So when it takes a, a snapshot of someone's form, for example, I can then use that brush and move it in a 360 fashion. So I would say a lot of the, the forms that come overall are from that movement. So. With that, thank you, Matthew. Thanks. Thanks again. And we're now going to set up for our next speaker. Thanks, Mike.